Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Minnesota. Uh, once again, a, a thank you to our, uh, our journalists, our press corps here. They are pooling for one another um, to keep the social distancing here at the Emergency Operations Center. Um, grateful you're all here. I'd like to send a thank you before we get started to Minnesotans. Last time we were here, we announced we were going to do a, uh, a homemade cloth face drive of face mask uh, drive to see how many we could collect and uh, Minnesotans responded just like Minnesotans do with about 130,000 of those masks uh, delivered to uh, fire departments across the, and every single one of them participated uh, across the state. Those are getting out to our uh, long-term care providers, some of the folks there we need to get them. So uh, to thank you for that, Minnesotans. And um, thank you for the work that you've been doing. I want to take a little time again. We know that we're coming up on May 4th. Um, I think it's time to assess where we're at, uh, see the things that have worked, making sure the plan that we have put in place to execute to make sure that we had the hospital beds when needed, make sure that we ramped up the testing, tracing, and isolation capacity, and make sure that we had a clear plan articulated to Minnesotans. How do we get back into uh, our businesses functioning? And I, I want to today, as we go through some of that, uh, call out that that sense of um, urgency and, and that sense of desperation around economic situation is real and validated. And why we are able to put those measures in, um, I still believe Minnesotans are finding a way not to force us to make a choice between public health and moving our commerce back into a functioning place. We can do both if you do it right. And I think the lessons from states around the country, maybe more importantly from some countries who have been able to do it pretty successfully, um, works. But I, I think when the story gets told, and I had the opportunity this week to tell the story to, uh, to Vice President Pence um, about what Minnesota is doing, that story is resonating with people because it, it, it threads that needle in a way that allows us to think a little more creatively, allows us to roll more things back into uh, the life that we knew before COVID, but with an understanding there's going to be adjustments. Um, when we're outside or in places where we can't social distance, we're wearing masks, uh, we're not congregating together, and that will probably continue for some time. But I do think it's worth noting, and I, I always think we're careful to make sure the science is there and there's validation that has to happen. But I think the announcements yesterday and Dr. Fauci's uh, I think validation, uh, I, not in terms of the science of it, uh, particular to that test, but the idea that it appears like we're on the edge of some pretty good breakthroughs on therapeutics that are starting to happen. And I think we should um, uh, pause when there's positive things to happen. And I think today there's a lot of positives to talk about in Minnesota. But uh, again, that's always against a backdrop of our second highest day of fatalities with 24, and we passed 5,000 um, tests, uh, or excuse me, positive test confirmed cases. Uh, we are, and I will show you, approaching the numbers we need. But just so Minnesotans know, since we've started this, and I'll show you a timeline, it seems nearly impossible um, that it was March 6th when we had our first COVID case positive in Minnesota. Um, and all that has happened since then and all of the landmarks that have happened and of course all of the, the disruptions to daily life. But by doing so, Minnesotans have saved time and uh, have, have saved lives and bought us critical time. Uh, we can show that with the data. We'll compare it against other states and it has worked. We have built the hospital capacity. You saw yesterday we finalized a lease on an alternate care site and stood that up. I want to thank Joe Kelly, his team, uh, Corps of Engineers, all the folks who worked on that and all of our partners. And if Joe needs to, he can answer some questions on that. We wanted to validate that concept. Some states, if you saw, they built in Central Park, they built the Javits Center, they built out. Um, lessons learned from those other states showed us we need to conserve resources, and I don't think at this time we're prepared. Joe, you could maybe correct me on this. Six other validated sites, or is it seven now that we could? Seven. Seven. What we could validate out, and within 72 hours we could stand those up. We don't think right at this point in time what we're seeing in the in the numbers that it, it warrants us spending that money and standing them up. I can assure Minnesotans, should a surge come and the capacity be needed to overflow, we could stand those up in 72 hours. The one we stood up here was to validate. It's the one because of uh, population density makes the most sense. But we proved we can do it. It's there. And that just adds to our capacity. Uh, Commissioner Roberts Davis and her team uh, working with uh, uh, People like Doug Baker and our, our private sector are acquiring the things that we need and we're in a good spot. And we announced that landmark testing strategy that will allow us to test every symptomatic Minnesotan. I'd also like to give thanks to the administration, to Vice President Pence and President Trump. When they were there, um, when we were at Mayo, I mentioned the, uh, the one thing that I needed uh, that we needed in Minnesota, and I was hearing from other governors, but especially us, us here to get to 20,000 
PCR tests and 15,000 serology tests were swabs. And I asked them to consider using the Defense Production Act um, on swabs. And uh, yesterday, last evening, uh, President Trump announced that he has uh, authorized the use of the Defense Production Act for swabs. Uh, that's a great partnership. It'll help us out. I am certainly grateful for that. Um, again, where we're at today, um, yesterday we did 3,279. I think it was Theo Keith said here a week ago, he said, where are we going to get near your 5,000? I said, hopefully before May 4th. That was my goal all along. Uh, there's still a chance we'll get to that. I want to clarify for the health people and for Jan. Uh, that number was to kind of drive us. We thought it was a starting point. We want to test all symptomatic Minnesotans, and then we want to expand it out to all others in frontline and positions that are of high risk. Um, that's why now it's our goal is to get to 20,000 as quickly as possible. The word coming out from our partners partnership with the University of Minnesota, all of the other health systems and the Mayo Clinic is, is that we are going to get there. Um, and what I want to remind folks of now when you see numbers, you are going to see Minnesota have more cases confirmed. The things that we are watching for very closely, and Commissioner Malcolm will talk about this, is are we exponentially increasing uh, hospital beds, hospital stays, and the number of deaths? And at this point in time, um, even though our numbers are going up, those other numbers are staying within the tolerance level where we think uh, it, it needs to be to keep away from that surge. I'd also talk about our website. A lot of folks talked about this. We use New Mexico as a template, and I want to thank uh, Governor Lujan Grisham in New Mexico and her team down there. They did open source on their website. We took on that and built it further where Minnesotans can go on, take a little diagnostic to see if they think they need a test. And now you can check up to 177. We've added 50 more in the last 48 hours to be able to test, see if they're there, what it takes to go in and get that test done. That's one of the reasons you're seeing the testing numbers go way up. Again, setting the bar of where we were, I took a couple of data points. I asked my team, if I asked Minnesotans to stay home, if I asked them to sacrifice the things they love, if I asked businesses to put themselves on the brink, why are they doing it and are you giving that? That was one of the reasons we put up the website to show you what we were getting in PPE, where we were on ICU beds. I think it's important to when we first asked this at the start of the pandemic on May 6th, we did not know. There was not, and no state did. There wasn't a real emergency response that had all the critical care capacity um, taken and put in one spot to be able to look at. Um, personal protective equipment, the state of Minnesota did not have that because the plan that many states, I think all states thought, um, was the strategic national stockpile would be used to surge on that. That proved not to be the case, so we started from zero. And then, of course, testing capacity for COVID-19. It wouldn't be unusual with a new novel coronavirus to come up that you wouldn't be able to test, but the testing is similar in terms of you just have a few things you have to change and stand it up, that is one thing that we started at zero and probably why the number of tests we have today, I think we'd be in a different spot if we'd have been running 3,200 tests in March 6th rather than on April 28th. Um, today, more than 2,500 critical care beds. You can see what uh, the commissioners had. And I want to be clear, hospitals request their own. Hospitals build up their own uh, PPE. Workplaces build up their own PPE. This is the state to be able to backfill, to help the folks we need, to be able to help with the surge capacity, be able to make sure the state patrol has them and others. And then testing capacity um, today is more than 2,000. Actually, it's third, about 3,300 and going up. And uh, we will soon, remaining progress needs to be made as you see this. Um, test all symptomatic Minnesotans. Once again, I want to show you this. This goes out, if those of you watching, and I'll try and stay close to this, if you're seeing the graph on the table, and it's, it's a little bit confusing because there's a lot here, it's all the states listed of where they're at. And it shows where from the first time we had 100 cases. And, and these are cases per 100,000 once you got to 100. We were in the lower end, but kind of towards the middle of the pack. That is the point when we started taking on March 13th, the executive order. And this is what you have done. And I wouldn't say this is not what the state has done as being state government. This is what you have done by staying home, by social distancing, by making good decisions, ours went down like this, which means there are a couple of states we're right about with Montana, Oregon, and California in terms of where we're at. Now, we can't eliminate COVID-19 at this point in time without a vaccine. But we can slow this, and this is the way it should look, to build slow herd immunity 
and not overwhelm the healthcare system. So I continue to show this though, um, for one reason also, there's a lot of states, and I'm gonna step here and point at this, that were bunched together right here. The virus doesn't care what state they're in, and it will act the way the virus acts by infecting people through droplets, by being on surfaces, whatever it might be. The only thing that separates these states on this graph is the decisions that were made by the people and by those states to, to stop and change the direction and the numbers to keep us under per 100,000. So that's why we are still, at this point in time, able to stay right with the top two or three states, even, and this is normed, to testing. Now, our objectives, as I've always said, help your safety and the happiness. And I don't use that term as a frivolous, I use it as well-being. And every single person who's mentioned the stay-at-home home order ha can have catastrophic effects on mental health. The stay-at-home order can have catastrophic effects on domestic violence. It can have domestic, and we, we've seen this and we'll talk about it today, it can have catastrophic effects as it has not just in this state, but globally on economics. So it is critical that that be built into anything we think about and how we go forward. We're trying to slow the spread, build herd immunity, realizing you're not going to eliminate it. Now the news from Dr. Fauci and coming out yesterday and some of the Gilead studies, um, this is pretty exciting stuff because just to be clear, um, there's some talk on vaccines, but the talk yesterday was more on the therapeutics, meaning that those that are most sick, those 5%, if we can significantly reduce the time they're in the hospital, the need to be uh, intubated on, on uh, ventilators, that, that's a game changer because it changes how we approach this. Protect working on the front line workers by increasing access to personal protective equipment. We still have that. Ensure the healthcare system can do everything they need. Strategically get more Minnesotans back to work. You're going to hear today. Bruce Nustedt's going to be here from our retailers, Minnesota Retailers Association, um, the partners who are figuring out how to get their folks back to work. We're going to hear from him, but I'm grateful for this, um, this partnership and understanding. These are the folks that are impacted. These are the small business owners. These are the, these are the businesses that are facing with customers of trying to figure out how do you both get folks back safely um, and get businesses going together. And I think there's an awful lot of thanks and a lot of world learning from them on what they can do. Um, and safely and slowly resume in-person contact and other activities. These things are important to our well-being. Um, those activities are important. And I, again, will talk about, I'm sure you get asked questions. Um, I'm just heartbroken on graduations and these types of things. This whole idea of what with the class of 2020, how do we start thinking about that and how do we uh, and use sports. Um, and again, I, I hope there's some questions around that because I would think just like the business community, there's smart people out there thinking about, well, is it possible for us to social distance on a baseball or softball field with each team using their own ball, catchers wearing another glove? Those are the smart things that we have to think about because we got to live with this for a while until we get those therapeutics and vaccines. And I've said from the very beginning and continue to say on this is you cannot isolate people indefinitely till that happens. And Minnesotans have found the middle way. Again, it's not that light switch it's not everything's opens tomorrow and it's not everything's locked down there's somewhere in between and I think the slide I showed previously about where we're at uh, bears out that that works again the factors that we've been asking about this is what we ask ourselves this is what we ask our partners in business this is what we ask everyone when we're making a decision and for those of you at home thinking about public health as being a part of this uh, diagram how does it impact spread of the disease? How prepared are we to test, trace, and isolate? Are hospitals prepared to treat patients? And how does this impact public health for non-COVID related illnesses? Um, I saw this story in today's, um, I believe it was in the Star Tribune, um, about the family waiting for the young child to get back surgery that is absolutely critical to that child's well-being, falls into that circle. Um, but might not be deemed essential surgery at this time. And I'm going to talk a little more about this because I think this is an area because of the good work Minnesotans have done, because of what the hospital has done, because of what Commissioner Roberts Davis has done, those are the things that we can now answer and say, yes, I think we can make some of these changes. Social distancing, can you effectively social distance when doing the action? Um, do we have the supplies needed for the workers and the customers to be safe? 
Uh, how big a gathering will people be safe and our setting predictable? And then the societal well-being. Will this action help spur economic recovery? I want to assure everyone out there that this idea of, of that if you just are putting in plugging in the public health, which is important. No one wants to um, have to make that choice. We are using those numbers around economics. We are saying what can happen. And I just want to be clear, those who are saying that we should open up all businesses tomorrow because this thing's not that serious and we overreacted, they are wrong. Those who are saying we should open up as fast as we possibly can because this is causing huge economic damage and we should figure out a way to do that that is the safest possible way to do it, those people are right. That is exactly what we should be doing and that's what the state of Minnesota is doing. And so does it action encourage other communities to return to civic life in a thoughtful way? Is this action meaningful improve the lives of people? So it's not as if um, those aren't huge considerations into this factors. All right, what we're announcing today is we're going to extend the stay-at-home order on bars, restaurants, and public accommodations till Monday the 18th of May. But we are moving retail businesses to reopen operations for curbside pickup and delivery, putting 30,000 Minnesotans back to work. Bruce is going to talk about this. He used a football analogy with me, which is always helpful, I guess, um, about this step that we're making to move this. This is a... Uh, this is a big move. It's, uh, it's a move that not a lot of states have taken. Some have opened up all the way and said that. Others have not. But what this allows us to do is it allows us to validate the Minnesota way of doing it. It allows us to believe that we can continue to social distance and use smart processes while continuing to test, trace, and isolate and not overwhelm the system. And again, I would go back to that slide. The problem with this thing, and, and again, I can answer some questions. We were down in Worthington yesterday. I'll answer at the end on, on the situation down there. We basically went to zero tests to 700 tests in 10 days, 700 positives, so that the per capita infection rate in Nobles County approaches New York City. And that happened between a week ago Sunday and today. And so the real thing we have to be focused on is, is not to be complacent, to be smart, to lean into things where we can, but with a recognition that we are on a very fine line with this uh, virus that can come very, very quickly. It won't be a slow burn. It will be exponential growth. So here's what we're asking them to do, and Commissioner Grove will take uh, a little more time with this. Bruce will talk about it from the perspective of someone and his members who are doing this. All customer-facing retail establishments are eligible for curbside delivery pickup starting next Monday. Uh, dry cleaning. Um, uh, candle sales, whatever it might be, all of them are, are available for that. Uh, every business will develop and post a plan for how to do this, templates available. Once again, the state of Minnesota is not collecting these and the state of Minnesota is not in the business of, uh, of, of hassling folks or trying to do this. We're in the business of making them successful because what the business community knows, if you don't get this right, people aren't going to come. If they know that your store is dangerous because you're not adhering to those principles, people are not going to come. Um, it, it, it's one of the reasons that um, we've got folks like Costco going to all masks. If you want to go shop in Costco, you want to wear a mask. The Grocers uh, Association is recommending that everyone go with a mask. We are recommending, and we'll bring that up, that everyone do that when they're in settings uh, when they're out in the public. Uh, online payment should be used in every... Uh, possible scenario. Employees and customers should wear masks, protective equipment. If curbside pickup scenarios, social distancing guidelines apply. If delivery scenarios, items should be posited. These are things that others have been doing. These are things that these retail establishments can do it. These are folks that have been thinking and gave us these ideas and said, let us go here and uh, validate that we can do this and then we can take it to the next step. So back to our dials. I want to note before we go into this, this is what we talked about. The bottom safe practices are the foundation to make this work. Washing hands, staying home and sick, social distancing, and wear a mask. Our job on COVID-19 response tests all symptomatic individuals, isolate positive cases and contract trace, protect those that are heightened risk, build needed capacity, which we are doing and have got there, and procure critical care supplies. That continues on. All of that will happen what we've done is in the workplace setting, we've cranked the dial again in the last, since the last time we talked six days ago, um, allowing for these curbside deliveries. It's highly predictable, but less predictable than just keeping everybody home. Um, and it's a smaller size setting. 
and I want to talk to those businesses that are out there, we can make this work. Um, we can show that it happens. Many of you have said so, and I believe it, and our numbers support this. It is not wishful thinking. When this is all over, um, I think there's going to be, uh, it, this will be done for decades, relooking at the pandemic of 2020. Um, I think one of the things that will be interesting is there's the science, the hard science and the medical science that falls into this. Then there's the behavioral sciences. Not all countries have responded the same way, and I would argue there are strong cultural implications there. And I have made the case here to my team time and time again, there is a social compact in Minnesota that manifests itself. We are always first or second in the number of people who vote. We are always first or second in charitable giving. Those types of things show a social responsibility to others that is pretty strong. And now, with the pandemic of 2020, we have shown that we can social distance and flatten as much as anything else. That is not because we have stay-at-home orders. It is because people have chosen to do this because they recognize social distancing, wearing a mask, following these rules, isn't just about them. In fact, it might not be about them at all. It's about their neighbor and their most vulnerable neighbors to get this right. So we're able to do that. On the social setting, we still have the, uh, the dial down because that's our strongest tool. But I want to, at this point, make clear. We believe that these dials can start to turn, especially now with the testing. And it is my belief, again, we are not setting the dials in place till May 18th. We're setting them for today. And Bruce will talk a little bit about this. We'll talk to his retailers. If there is the potential for us to get and show that we can do this curbside right, we get people moving, and we have the plans in place to allow some retail transactions inside the stores with a limited number of people, then it is our intention to do that. Um, as long as we are not getting to where we get hotspots, every time I say this, I know the health people have to balance out the economic side of this, and we're trying to continue to thread that needle. Um, whoops, I'll go back one. This is a big step, too, and I want to let everybody know the ban on elective surgeries, this is in working with partnership with the hospitals. The hospitals themselves and many of these ambulatory care facilities asked us to put this in place with them because the reason we did it was the belief that if we needed all of that surgical equipment like ventilators, PPE, mask, gloves, gowns, if we were doing these elective surgeries, we would not have enough on hand because not everybody stocked for this. As you saw a slide further back, we were basically at zero and there was no backfill from the state. Well, in the four weeks that you've given us, we have significantly built up our supplies. Should we have more? Absolutely. We're looking every day. The hospitals have done the same thing. And right now, I would ask all of you, it's online. You can go online to the COVID site. Um, we want public input on this to get folks to be able to, to get online. Um, the hospitals, the, the, the elective surgery, the, the doctors, the medical personnel, they've all been part of this decision. And what we're trying to do in working with them is to be able to announce it in a few days. If we keep making this progress, um, we believe that we can do this. And, and that has several implications. First and foremost, it has the implications of relieving the pain and the people who are out there waiting. I want to just be clear and validate um, the idea if you're waiting for a knee or a hip or this young, uh, this child who was waiting for back surgery, um, this has not been easy. And I think to be able to call it elective, probably from your perspective, um, you may not call it that. You would call it necessity. And that's, that's what I think you're right. Um, so our hope is, is that that allows those people to go back. It also has another effect on this, that it starts to add revenues back to the hospitals. It starts to bring people who were laid off because their specialty wasn't COVID care or emergency care. Their specialty was to deal with knee surgery or hip surgery or whatever the specialty was, um, dentistry or whatever it might be be. So we believe, and there should be an announcement in the coming days, but this has to be done in coordination with the hospitals, and the hospitals will be the ones that sign off on this. They will know, looking at their numbers, looking at the modeling projections, looking at what we have in reserve to make the, 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 the call to say, this much of what we have, we're going to keep in reserve for the surge that can come. Now that we have excess of that, we're going to start rolling people back in to have 
normal care. Um, and they will work that out, how to make sure that those, those uh, systems work. And uh, this, is a good, this is a good development. We'll continue having ongoing industry-specific consultations with businesses and the labor community. And as a next step, this includes making plans to safely open um, other non-critical customer-facing settings. Um, this is a little busy, but I asked my team to put this together last night. The reason I say this is, is this got put together when I asked. It's hard for people to, the time frame in this, to think how much happened since March 6, first confirmed case in Minnesota. And here's where I want to thank the public health department. I want to thank the health care providers who are out there. And I want to thank the Minnesota legislature. It was weeks before this when we already gathered, started thinking of a plan and put money into the account to have Commissioner Malcolm have the money early. And thinking about this, there was a very heated debate whether it was too bold to go with $20 million or to have $10 million. Now the nation is trillions of dollars into this fight, and that is the mindset that changed. That was a very aggressive ask at the time because of what the situation appeared on the ground. And this is what is gone since then. March 13th, we did a peacetime state of emergency. We worked to put our hospital support, our surge plans in place. Um, we had the commissioner start getting PPE. We worked with our schools to provide for distant learning. Um, we secured funding for critical public health and hospital providers surveyed sites. Joe was out there setting this up. That was happening back March 17th. Yesterday, that site is ready, validated, and we're ready to go in place. We issued the stay-at-home order, and I know this is hard for everybody to imagine. That was on March 25th. That was a month ago. Um, we worked with hospitals and long-term care to start staffing up their needs. Um, signed the lease with that alternative, uh, alternative care center. Extended the stay-at-home on April 30th. Now, there's where we're at today, May 1st. We're going to revise the EO and elective strategies. We hope to be able to open additional customer-facing businesses. Um, we hope to be able to start turning the dial on small family gatherings that are in the same family where we can start to know. And if there is a problem, we can test, trace, quarantine, and get that right. Um, opening places of worship, which comes up in, again, I would ask all of you to keep in mind, all of this is predicated on the bottom part of that slide with social distancing, stay home if you're sick, masks, and we're continuing to test and grow things out. And then open high contact businesses like barbershops and salons, and then the rest that's to come. And it's our belief that some of this can happen during this current time between now and May 18th, um, predicated on the numbers, predicated on a trajectory on testing that is going in exactly the way it needs to go, and then building up of that contract tracing team that Commissioner Malcolm has been working on and is doing, a, uh, doing the work that needs to be done. So it is going to be different. I, I think all of us have come to that. Even as we reopen, not going to be the same. As we turn the dial, here's what we're asking. If you're already teleworking, keep doing it. If you can keep doing that, that's just the smartest thing. Um, wearing face masks in public. Um, it, it is unfortunate this week that the visit to Mayo was ended up being a story of the mask. And I, I saw today Vice President Pence was at a facility and he was wearing a mask. So um, I, I appreciate that. But I, I do want to say the Vice President's visit was incredibly productive. The partnership was incredibly focused. The groundbreaking work that we were able to witness was hugely inspiring. And, and I just think for us, like so much of what we're doing, the simple gesture of wearing that mask in public um, goes an awful long ways. There is some pretty good data behind it that it might help you from infecting someone else, but I do think there's a psychological piece behind it to show that we're all in this together and we really are getting it. It shows that commitment. This is like digging down, and, and I know uh, Dr. Osterholm uses the baseball game analogy. Um, I would like to think we're in a marathon, and those who've done that, um, I think we're a ways down that, Tom. This might be for you. People say, oh, if we're at mile 20. Well, those who know, mile 20 to mile 26.2 is the hardest part. And I think our analogy is we've done a lot of good work. I think we're running into that place. And I think I want to give without the false hope. There is every reason to be very positive that Minnesota is going the right way. There's every reason to be very positive about some of the drug interactions that are, that are starting to happen out there. There's every reason to believe that, that the research is working and that we are finding a more stable way. Is it pleasant 
to go out in a mask? Is it pleasant to wait six foot before you go into Trader Joe's? No, none of those things are. Um, would you rather be with your family in the backyard with a larger gathering? Absolutely. Um, but there are some of these things we can do. We can return to a sense of some of these things that bring that well-being meter up by doing this. Um, and again, I go back to the sporting events and the cultural gatherings. This is the most, I think we're finding out what we really value, and those things are important and, and they're difficult. So I'm going to ask you, Minnesotans, uh, continue what you're doing um, in the social distancing. Even if there were not a stay-at-home order, that is the thing to do because that is the surest way to get beyond this and get things back to the way we want them to be. I'm asking you to help these businesses by doing the things like social distancing and the mask when they open up. They are ready to go. Once we validate and prove this, we can start bringing most of those customer-facing things back online. I'm asking you all to now get online if you need to, comment on this elective surgery, check where we have. We're not going to put us at risk by using too much, but my pledge to you is we're not going to stockpile all of this equipment and wait if we know that the numbers and we have a confidence level that's high enough to believe that we can use some of that now for those types of surgeries. Those are smart things and those are only reason we're able to do that is because of what you've done over the last uh, four weeks. That is, that is the only reason that we have that many because you adhered to doing the things necessary. So I am uh, grateful for your work. We'll take questions here at the end. I'm going to have Commissioner Malcolm update us a little bit of where she's at. Commissioner Grove and Bruce can talk a little bit more. What does this mean to businesses and what is it going to look like Monday afternoon? Are the shops on Grand? Are the shops in Mankato going to be back open? And how will that look? So, Commissioner? Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to give you just a, a brief situation update from a data perspective. As of early this morning, globally, we were over 3.2 million cases around the world and sadly 228,000 deaths. In the United States, we're now over 1 million cases and 61,000 deaths. Here in Minnesota, as the governor has said, we had another big jump in cases, uh, almost 500 more cases from yesterday. We are now at 5,136 total cases. I just want to reinforce something the governor said that I think is very important, and that is what we've seen about the potential for hot spots to really spike these numbers quickly. The more we, the more we test, the more we're going to find, and now we're experiencing some of the potential for really rapid growth in certain geographies and certain settings. The governor mentioned in Nobles County, uh, we're up to 700 cases in the span of about a week. Candy Ojai County, 87. Stearns County, 187. Uh, Cottonwood, 20. Martin County, 72. So those are uh, just examples of how quickly things can change, to the governor's point about the need to be very thoughtful and, and vigilant here. We've seen the similar dynamic in terms of long-term care facilities and how very important it is to be able to do the testing and then the tracing and the isolation and quarantine to keep those, set, the, those situations as manageable as possible. Sadly, we did have another 24 deaths in Minnesota yesterday, bringing our total to 343. And the demographics continue to be very similar. 15 of these 24 deaths were in Hennepin County, three in Ramsey, two in Anoka, one each in Clay, Dakota, Washington, and Winona. And the age ranges of these individuals continue to skew toward uh, the elderly. Six people in their 90s, seven in their 80s, eight in their 70s, two people in their 60s, and one younger person in their 40s with significant underlying health conditions. And as of today, 2,172 patients have been released from isolation. And the governor mentioned the importance of keeping our eye on that hospitalization number, and particularly those in intensive care. There are currently 365 patients in the hospital, 130 of them in intensive care. So that proportion in intensive care has stayed in that, in that range that we're really forecasting and looking for it to be manageable. The governor updated you on the, the, the steady growth that we are seeing in testing. Over uh, almost 3,300 tests performed yesterday, which was our, uh, our high, except for the day that we had, actually that was our high. We exceeded the day that we had the drive-through uh, drive clinic um, in, uh, in Worthington a few days ago. 
And the governor mentioned, too, the fact that each of the health systems is working to maximize their testing capability with Mayo and the university bringing on additional capacity above and beyond what they have had. We expect that that, uh, that, that number is going to continue to increase, that we'll have an additional uh, increment of, of 1,000 and 2,000 and 3,000 cases in the days to come from additional capacity that's being built as well as unleashing the capacity that already exists by getting the supply chain flowing correctly, the swabs and the reagents and so forth, because we know we've theoretically got a bunch of capacity there, um, but we're building more on top of that. And I think I will, with, at, with that, turn it over to Commissioner Grove. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Malcolm. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to just give some more context and details around Executive Order 2048, which the governor signed uh, just a little bit ago, that allows retailers to come back and do curbside uh, pickup and delivery. And the first thing I want to say is that this guidance was not developed uh, alone inside of government. It is the result of countless amounts of, of meetings and conversations with the Chambers of Commerce, uh, retail associations, business leaders, and labor leaders around the state. Uh, it's really important that we get these guidance uh, documents right in concert with business to make sure uh, that we're getting this right for, for businesses. And this move to turn that dial towards uh, curbside pickup and delivery is very consistent with both the guidance of the National Retail Federation and Minnesota Retailers Association. You'll hear from Bruce in a moment on that. They both recommend starting in phases to go to this curbside delivery uh, space first and then move to fully opening up. The, the, the importance of phases, they tell us, is that it gets businesses acclimated to this new way of doing business. It gets uh, customers acclimated to the kind of uh, physical environment of coming into a store or coming into a business um, with the protective equipment needed, with that social distancing to get right, so that when we do turn the dial a little bit further, there's, there's, a gro there's growth there. And I think for businesses to teach each other during this time how to get this right uh, with the guidance that we've released is just really important. I do also want to say that we know that the progress the governor went through a moment ago that our state has made over the last month has been, we think, probably disproportionately on the backs of small businesses in our state. It is small businesses who've most often had to close. You know, I can say as, as the son of a small business owner myself, I w grew up working for my dad's landscaping company, it's hard enough to operate a small business when times are good. Uh, but during a global pandemic, when you have to pause your operations to keep the state safe, that's it's devastatingly difficult. And we're just very grateful that small businesses have been willing to do that, um, to put themselves on pause now. Um, and it's really why it's so important that we make these steps today. We know that when small businesses look at the, at the big box store, that's able to stay open because they sell critical items that society needs as per that Department of Homeland Security guidance, that seems a little bit unfair and, and I think it's important now that we take this step both to, to begin to open up our economy and to get those businesses running again. So um, we think today's announcement will help uh, 30,000 Minnesotans get back to work. Um, as the governor said, the state home guidance remains in place for two weeks, but by Monday, May 4th, that's next Monday, we're allowing all customer-facing retail establishments in Minnesota to open up outdoor, curbside, uh, pickup, and delivery. So just to get a bit more specific about who that involves, this involves any retail store or business that sells, rents, or maintains or repairs goods that can reasonably be picked up outside by a customer when, without entering a place of the business uh, and with limited interaction between the worker and the customer. Uh, this includes household goods rentals, maintenance services, repair services, and pet grooming, which are all included in this order. I know there's lots of questions out there about salons and, and barbershops. Um, this order allows salons and barbershops to open up the retail portion of their business so they can sell those products to folks through this order, uh, but they cannot uh, open up to give haircuts or provide individual services to customers. So similar to the order that we did earlier for, for industrial uh, manufacturers and offices, uh, office settings, which started on Monday, we're following a, a similar roadmap here for, for curbside delivery and pickup for retailers. Every uh, retailer who comes back uh, into business next Monday to do this curbside and delivery has to build a plan. And we have a COVID preparedness, uh, COVID-19 preparedness plan on mn.gov slash deed slash safe work. Um, we've adapted it a little bit to include some guidance around customer uh, pickup and delivery. Um, you don't have to use that template exactly, but it's there for your use. Uh, we are not asking businesses to submit those plans to state government. We're not reviewing them one by one. Again, we're talking about probably 10,000 businesses that are now going to be coming into this. Um, that's not a good use of our time or yours. We're asking businesses to make that plan for your workers, for your customers 
customers so that people know what to do. And of course, uh, we reserve the right to ask for your plan if we hear complaints, but really want, uh, really want businesses to just take the lead here as they have so far. Secondly, we ask every business to engage in health screenings, as we have for other businesses that are, that are up and running. As you saw earlier this week, we launched the Minnesota Symptom Screener uh, from our uh, Department of IT, a great partnership between Target, state government, and the Minnesota Safety Council. This symptom screener is a great way for businesses to track health conditions over time uh, and make sure they can ensure that their employees are safe. It is optional, but it's there for use. Uh, it's also optional for employees to enter their data, but it is anonymous and aggregated data that will help businesses uh, be more effective on the health screening front. We're also pleased to see and announce just yesterday that Target has procured uh, tens of thousands of more infrared thermometers and are, are providing them at wholesale cost to Minnesota businesses. So you go to Target.com and you can log into your business account there and purchase those thermometers uh, at wholesale cost. Workers and customers who engage in commerce through uh, curbside delivery and pickup are asked to try to wear masks as often as possible and gloves too to prevent uh, the, the contact the, government, the governor spoke of a moment ago. And then in terms of the actual engagement on curbside pickup and delivery, you know, we're learning a lot from, from the pizza delivery guys, the food delivery guys, the, the, the floral shops and, and what have you in terms of how they've gotten this right. Uh, under no circumstances can customers enter a business when they are there to pick something up. In every case possible, we ask that they stay in their cars. In some instances, there's not a place to park your car or a parking lot. You might have to get out of your car to pick something up, but you just got to be careful when you do that. Make sure that you remain six feet away from the item as you, as you, as you come to get it. And delivery uh, professionals who are coming to people's homes to deliver goods also need to uh, remain outside of the house and wherever possible, you know, drop that item outside of the house when they, when they come to someone's home. And contactless payment, which uh, Bruce tells me 9 out of 10 businesses are using now anyway, is really important here too, so there's not an exchange of cash. Um, hopefully uh, that is uh, available in almost every case. We strongly suggest it to prevent uh, as much contact as possible. I also just wanted to say in terms of sort of what's next here, you know, as the governor mentioned, we're continuing to every day evaluate that dial and what we can do to get more businesses back up and running. And so we're beginning a, a whole new phase of really in-depth, detailed consultation with different sectors in, in our business community because no one understands uh, what this pandemic means for our economy more than the folks who make that economy run. So these consultations are really critical. And I think, you know, from the small retailers to the business owners to all the community organizations we've been discussing with this feedback and, and, and time that you've given us, this flexibility you've given us to understand how to get this right is really a gift to state government. And so just to give folks a sense, we have convened regular meetings with advocacy groups and nonprofits representing communities of color, uh, chambers of commerce, businesses and trade associations, uh, consumer advocates for adults and people with disabilities, uh, labor unions and organizers, disability service providers, mu municipal and county governments, tribal governments, places of worship, uh, and many, many more. And I think as we get into these next phases of what types of businesses need to be uh, uh, thinking about different types of social distancing guidance, we're starting to get really specific. So we're doing weekly calls with the museums and cultural organizations, weekly calls with the gyms and the studios and, and the fitness centers, weekly calls with restaurants and bars and those associations, weekly engagements with salons and barbershops, small retailers, sporting venues, youth recreation, and on and on and on. So I think we're getting into this phase of things where getting really specific on how to get these things right in different types of business settings is just really critical to get right. Before I turn it over to Bruce, who's going to share the perspective of the Retail Association, I wanted to just uh, give folks an update on our unemployment numbers, uh, as we do every day. Uh, since March 16th, we're up to 584,431 applications for unemployment insurance since, uh, since March 16th, as I said. That downward trend does continue, um, and so we're, we're pleased to see that. Uh, but folks should continue to please apply at uimn.org. Many of the cases that we're dealing with right now are uh, independent contractors and the self-employed who are now eligible for unemployment insurance under that federal benefit, uh, the Pandemic uh, Unemployment Insurance Act. Um, we have made initial payments to about 40,000 Minnesotans. I'm told by the team just this morning we have about 10,000 more payments going out just today. So we are we're moving very carefully and methodically to get that program right. We know how important it is to Minnesotans, and we're doing so in a way that prevents fraud and ensures that people get the money that they deserve and, and desperately need. So with that, I want to introduce Bruce Nostad. We're really, really thrilled to have Bruce here today. He's been a great voice for Minnesota retailers, a real confidant and counselor of, of DEED and, and our governor's office as we have engaged in this journey. Bruce has had a long history of working for several different chambers of commerce throughout the state, and he's been at the helm of uh, the Retail Association here in Minnesota since 2012. So Bruce, thank you for your leadership, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Commissioner. 
Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Governor, so much. Uh, today is a big day from an announcements perspective. There's no doubt about it. Uh, my name is Bruce Newstead. I'm, as was said, the president of the Minnesota Retailers Association. Uh, we're a collection of innovative retailers across the state that work together to promote, preserve, and enhance Minnesota's retail industry. Um, our membership is interesting. It ranges from the smallest of small Main Street shops to sort of your multi, mid-size retail operations and even some of the national brands. So the association really represents what retail looks like in Minnesota today. Uh, there are about 69,000 retailers in Minnesota that uh, take it very seriously, their role to provide a strong, stable economy for Minnesota, and really one community at a time. Uh, retail touches one in four jobs, believe it or not, and we're so proud of those retail workers today that are on the front line uh, serving customers for the critical needs, and we're excited to see uh, some of those retail employees return under this uh, order as well. Uh, we take very seriously health and safety. Every interaction with a customer today is, is done with the thought of how is this going to be done in a safe manner that gets the customer what they need when they need it. And when we see curbside open up on Monday, uh, we'll see those same parameters. Um, it's no secret that retail has been hit hard uh, by COVID-19, uh, just like all Minnesotans and all, all uh, industries have as well. And at the association, uh, we've worked with the governor and his staff to really talk about how we need to balance that public health element with the economic health element. And I think today's action shows that uh, there's some great understanding of the economics of today's situation and especially an appreciation of how you balance that with public health. Um, as was said, this announcement will allow curbside delivery, uh, drop off and pick up, and that is an important step for retailers. Uh, there are literally thousands and thousands, probably somewhere between 10 and 15,000 retailers today that aren't able to conduct business that'll be picked up by this order. Uh, so if you're one of those, uh, we're, we're, we're grateful and we're happy uh, that this action's taken place and uh, Minnesotans have our commitment to do it in a safe and secure manner that not only protects our customers, but our employees as well. Uh, as the governor's mentioned with all these things, you know, this is not a full solution, but this is a step. And quite frankly, for retail, this is a really important step. Uh, my football analogy was quite simply, this is sort of like putting retail in that final game of the playoffs. This is your chance to get your game plan down really good. Make sure everybody's playing well, because right around the corner is the Super Bowl. And I, I believe the governor is very intentional when he says, you know, we're working toward a reopening of stores. And I know it requires a lot of patience because there are a lot of retailers who want to see those stores open today. But this is your, uh, your final game in the playoffs and we're getting close to the Super Bowl. Uh, I do want to thank the governor and Commissioner Grove and all the other commissioners and your staff uh, for a great level of communication. Um, I, Commissioner Grove is exactly right. We spent hours and days in conversations. And I know sometimes you'll see an email box, send your suggestions to the government. And sometimes retailers, they do that and they think nobody reads it. Well, I have learned over the last weeks that people are reading those things. You might not get the answer that you want today, but there are folks that are reading, digesting that, and taking that into account when putting these plans in place. So, Governor, thank you for that, and Commissioners, thank you for that as well. I'm happy to cover any questions that folks might have, but again, on behalf of retailers that are able to conduct some business via curbside, from Thief River Falls to Austin to my hometown of Winona, you know, thank you for this action. It is meaningful. Thank you, Bruce. Yep. Well, thank you to Bruce. Um, thank you to all the retailers out there. Your, uh, your sacrifice has saved lives. Your sacrifice has allowed us. And as I said on the slide, if, if we're going to ask Minnesotans um, to make the sacrifice to buy us that time, we're going to use it wisely. And our job is to expand testing, tracing, uh, isolation, be able to put out hotspots, and be able to do things like this in collaboration with the people who know how to deliver it. Um, thank you for your patience from the media today. We had quite a bit to cover, but Mary, why don't you start us out? Yes, Governor. So far, the reaction from Senate Republicans is disappointed, and specifically a number of Minnesotans had said, you gave us a date, you gave us numbers. One, use the analogy, as a former football coach, one, use the analogy that you've moved the goalpost today. How do you explain going from May well, 4th that, to May 4th? Well, that's simply not the case, and I have been very specific about not setting dates certain because they are dependent on how the virus acts. They are dependent on the actions that we take. We have done something that other states haven't done. We have done shorter increments, pledge to do things during that time, and then go forward. Um, I think you'll hear today is, again, 
if the disappointment is you should have just opened up everything, they're not ready to open. People are not ready to go back. If you look at polling, over 70% of people say they feel they're, they're, they don't want to at this point in time feel like they can do that. So I think uh, I don't think it's fair to say the goalposts are moved. I've never said we would be out of this. I'm not saying it today that we're out of it by May 18th. But what I pledged is, is if you give us that time, I will get you results. And the results are probably the most extensive testing package. The results are, thanks to Minnesotans, the flattest numbers that are out there. And the results are, if you go and look, we probably has a higher percentage of businesses open as almost any other state. But it has been done strategically, because we are up above 82%. It has been strategically to not let people, because there is one of the fears that I think you saw with California. They have done a really nice job, and you saw it up there. And they opened the beaches and it went south fast. Now all the beaches are closed, and they're back to it. So I think we have set parameters. We have set goals. We have turned the dial. We told them we would turn the dial. If I believed I could crank that dial, that dial all the way to the right today, that's exactly what I'd like to do. But it is not ready. So if the critique is, how much more can you crank the dial, I would like to see the data that shows that we could crank the dial more. And I'm telling you, having come from Worthington yesterday, you crank that dial wrong, and it is catastrophic on what it can do. It does not matter. There doesn't. I, I guarantee you this today in Worthington, you don't need any stay-at-home order for people to stay at home um, because they know what happens if you go out, and they certainly know what happens if you go into an affected area without a mask. Tom? Uh, Governor, we learned yesterday that more than 99% of the people who have died in Minnesota of COVID-19 are either in long-term care facilities or have underlying health conditions, and not to minimize any of that, no. if that trend continues, will that impact your decision on whether to ratchet open the economy sooner than you currently plan to? Yeah, and, and I think, and you phrase that right, Tom, I think you know, every life is valuable, and I, I think we understand that. I do think, though, we've seen this in other states. This is a pattern that plays itself out. COVID is most dangerous to those in congregate living facilities. It is most dangerous to the elderly, and it's most dangerous to those with underlying health conditions. I think our goal has always been along, uh, all along this process, and again, not moving the goalpost, once we had the capacity to test, trace, and isolate, the goal here is to move to a scenario where we isolate those most vulnerable while we're slowly building this herd immunity. So it absolutely does, Tom, have an impact in that. And I think, Commissioner, and, and we were on for a long time last night, about two hours, um, talking to experts across the country. I'm talking to other governors. What is the strategy around long-term care and isolating that? We have a number on how many of today's deaths were long-term care yeah, related. Did. It was 24 deaths total, but how many were long-term care? I think it holds true to it. Yeah, I didn't uh, give you that number today, did I? Um, 22. So yep. 22 of the 24. Exactly so that, right. So that trend continues. It continues. So you're going to keep that in mind as you decide. Absolutely. And we have the whole time. And I, I think those of you out there listening, a lot of this kind of seems counterintuitive at times because the real answer here is what I think you'd like to see is okay you know with about 90 to 95 percent certainty who is most vulnerable here you know where most of the deaths are happening why don't you build the proverbial wall around them put the emphasis on that have the other social distance and 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 allow more things to open up that's basically the plan of what we're trying to do the problem is with asymptomatic transmission and do knowing that it goes to younger people too um how do you actually do that but uh i i i absolutely on this question would validate your point on this is we need to get to that point because we're going to live with this for a while i'm excited about some of the developments that were coming out yesterday we're going to live with this for a while and our goal and i think this is where commissioner malcolm uh, Dr. Osterholm had been. He told me early on when we were having this talk clear back in February that the best thing to do is if you could, you would isolate everybody down and you'd wait till you got a vaccine or got therapeutics. But he was very clear at the time. He said, that is not possible nor sustainable and you will make it worse if you do that. So you need to strike a balance between finding that place where you can isolate and find out who has it and yet moving the rest of the people back in. So that's a good point. Is that Walker? Yeah. Um, it appears that Minnesota right now has more deaths per capita than our neighboring states. And while we are ramping up testing, we are still testing fewer people per capita than our neighboring states. Why pick right now to start loosening things up? I know that I don't think they have more deaths per capita, do they? We'll validate that. Yeah, I would have to see that data. Yeah. No, it's a good, uh, your question, though, 
even without that being the fact, you're right, because the question is, is that you just announced you had 24 deaths. You just announced that you had another 400 cases added. Um, this is this is the sticky one um, because I think the either or scenario on this would say is, and I think it is, it appears like Minnesota is climbing the curb. I think that's true. We are. It is going to take a little more data points and a little longer time for us to get there, but I think the numbers are starting to show that. I would go back to the point, though, we do believe we have the hospital capacity, and we do believe that we're not having an inordinate amount. I'd like to check the number on deaths that are there. Um, but at this point in time, this is where there's a difference with CDC guidance and the White House guidance. The White House guidance said to go to phase one, which we have moved beyond that basically with what we're doing here today and what we did this week. You had to have 14 days of declining numbers. We're not certain that that's a good indicator of where we're at or the ability to protect Minnesotans and get the care that they need. So um, we are, and this would be, there would be an argument. There are many states that are taking the, the, the tack. They are not opening up. They are clamping down more things because of the belief that they're heading into that. We think because of Minnesota's social distancing, and we think because of the results we're getting overall in cases per 100,000, um, that we are getting results and still being able to do this retail activity. I do think the thing, and just candidly, that concerns me is these long-term care facility uh, fatalities are things that we have to continue to focus on and figure it out. We, I say, as Minnesotans and we as a country, because it's just a disproportionate number. But we have weighed that out. I, I think those who are bringing that up as a point, it's a very valid point. I can tell you we had uh, spirited discussions amongst the healthcare community, amongst everyone else. But I would not put people out there and open up the way we're opening up some of these things. If I believed that the risk factor was too high, I do believe the work that we've done does have the capacity for us to be able to deal with this. We certainly want to avoid getting anyone who's going to fall into that 5% that ends up in ICU sick. So we really need to focus on that. But this does really go back to this. The vast majority of people are not going to need hospitalization. And those that do, given hospitalization, many of them come out okay. Like I said, this word coming out from Dr. Fauci, the real game changer would be in a therapeutic. That would be for those 5% at the end, and now you're in a whole different situation. Governor, right? statewide media have a lot of outdoor-related questions. They want yeah. to know RV parks, campgrounds, fishing opener, and youth sports. Any wiggle yeah. room on those or changes? Um, Steve, you might answer on this. Not, not yet at this time. Um, but again, I would go back to my slide on the well-being, uh, especially in Minnesota. I think this is a hugely important question. I think it goes back to the golf question. I, I, I think it extends into people who have that same passion for a few other things. And that's why I say keep – I ask the folks out there who are doing this, the youth sports people are thinking incredibly creative, and I think that's how we get to a yes on that. But at this point in time, the health advice and the things we're at – didn't have us move today, but I think for people to say, and this might go back to the moving goalpost situation, um, what we're saying is, is even during this lockdown, if we have proof and we can validate processes that work like Bruce was talking about, if we can start out small and show these things work, we're willing to look at that. So I don't think... Within that real quick too, what sure. about some of the inequities about what is allowed? Many folks are yeah. saying golf, golf courses are allowed, but cities totally are taking fair. down nets and parks, and that creates inequity. They are totally fair, and I, I don't have a good answer for you for that. I, I think what Lieutenant Governor Flanagan says this. She heard somebody use this term and said, COVID-19 is the great equalizer. We're all in it together. She said, uh, actually, it's not the great equalizer. It's the great unequalizer in terms of it falls most heavily on communities that were already had inequities falling on them. So um, I can also tell you this was, a, this was a delicate question, and it was one that was debated very heatedly amongst our administration around that, that it was viewed, but it was our belief to follow the data, and the data on it showed that golf could be social distance, it could answer the public health questions that were up there, and still get to the societal well-being. We weren't able to answer that with pickup basketball games. Now, I, I do just want to call that out. The inequities created by this are real. The inequities that have been created by distant learning are real. Um, they are falling heavily on communities of color and socially disadvantaged communities. So we are trying to work that. We hear it. Um, I simply, I, I don't have an answer for that today other than that we made that decision, what we thought moved one in, and it, it's created that. COVID-19 has done that, Tom. Governor, a couple of questions about significant cultural events. You alluded to them earlier. I just got a message from a 
a woman who says she's literally crying along with her daughter today, trying to determine whether or not they can have a wedding uh, yeah. this summer. That is a, a huge issue for a lot of people. And then also, is there anything in your executive order uh, on education that uh, does not allow schools to still have graduation ceremonies if they have proper social distancing guidelines in the month of June? Yeah, and the, the, well, the, the large gatherings, of course, are a part of it. We don't want them to have this. But I can tell you, and I want to, again, validate several of these things. First of all, to the, to the listener in the wedding, um, I won't pretend that I, I know how bad your heart's breaking. It, I, I can't imagine what that would be like. Um, I, I also do the same with trying to bury our dad. Um, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan mentioned this morning that uh, she has not yet been able to grieve or properly pay respects to her big brother who died of COVID-19. And, and this is causing, that's the emotional well-being part. That's why there are, there are costs involved with social distancing that are pretty dramatic. Um, and we're trying to we're trying to tackle um, to meet where that's at, and um, I uh, I think on the on the the graduations and those things. Um, my wife Gwen is a 29 year educator is is spending an inordinate amount of time on this because I think Gwen is internalizing this very much so. Um, having just gone through a graduation last year with our senior, this is a really important rite of passage. And the ceremony, we're going to have to figure out something on this. So what I can tell you is we know the time is coming short. I can tell you we are spending a lot of time on it. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to do these. But, but what I want to tell Minnesotans is we're trying to figure out a way to allow some of that to happen in so some way. Is that on both graduations and weddings? Because people want answers and they're getting a lot of vagueness. No. Is there a chance there could be June weddings and yeah, June graduations? I wish I, yeah, I wish I didn't have vagueness in this. I think the problem is, is that there is no clear cut. I don't know what those numbers will look like tomorrow or what the social distancing will look like. What I can guarantee you is, is my desire to turn that knob as quickly as we can is really strong. It has to be balanced against my desire to listen to the health experts about not putting people at risk. Um, at this point in time, if it were today, I would say no, we couldn't do them today. Can we do them by the end of May or June? Potentially. And I think that's what we're saying with Bruce is using his analogy. My guess is these retailers are super good at this. They're super adaptable. They're entrepreneurs and innovators by nature. They're going to figure out new ways to do this, new ways to get people in their stores, new ways. I heard uh, Commissioner Grove talk about people are going to become really good at precision shopping. Um, they're going to think this through. They're going to get out there. They're going to zero in. They're going to buy that. Um, I, I want to say, Tom, um, that I, I think I need to give people a realistic picture, but I also think that the way we're doing this, the importance of giving people hope that those types of things can be done, I'm trying my best to find a way to do them without putting people at risk. So at this point in time, you've got my commitment to continue to use the data, to use what we can do, to figure out if there's new ways to do it. Um, it's just, this is just the worst of all things, that the things we like to do most are the exact thing the virus wants us to do to be able to spread. And that's by, I mean, that's just nature working its brilliance, that that's how it gets out there. So um, I wish, I, again, to all those people listening, it is not being vague because I wish to be vague. It's vague because I don't know the answer yet. Governor, uh, this is from Minnesota Public Radio. Uh, they asked, traffic patterns and foot traffic at stores that are open suggest the stay-at-home order is already breaking down or at least fraying. Does an extended order have any real might behind it? And what should law enforcement be doing when they encounter large groups? Yeah, it's a great question. And just to be clear, let, let's get this right now. There is no one would be listening to this press conference if it wasn't for the COVID-19. It is 70 degrees on the last day of April. The trees are budding out. The flowers have come out. Um, you would be at baseball games, track meets. Um, it, it has totally disrupted, um, disrupted everything of where we're at. I want to, I want to be clear. People are moving around. And again, I, just so people know this, I, I, I think that it goes back to this. There is a social compact, even pre-COVID, that requires people to act somewhat altruistically most of the time, that you can't mandate behavior just by laws. 
Most people don't assault other people because they know it's the wrong thing to do. Now, we do have laws in place for those people who need to, and we try and enforce it. This is totally different. People are trying to go out and get some fresh air. People are thinking about going and buying a gift for their grandparents. So I have said from the beginning that this is going to take a buy-in, which Minnesotans did, and it is going to take, this is where I go back to what I said earlier in this. There is a social science PhD in this for somebody to figure out why do certain countries adhere differently? Why does Singapore act the way it did? Why did Sweden act the way it did? Why did New Zealand act the way it did? Why did Minnesota act differently than New York? And here, what I am, with all of my might encouraging you, we are getting this as right as anybody else in the country, but we could get it as wrong as anybody else in the country. And my power under or, or, or executive order under the powers granted by Chapter 12 of Minnesota statutes is really just to the side compared to the commitment of Minnesotans to say, if I do this, I keep my neighbors safe and I get things back sooner. So as far as this, I, just to be clear, the state is not requiring these businesses to put them in because we have to trust our neighbors getting this right. Now, if we see there's a bad actor, and I know everybody's best angels won't come forward, but what I do believe is it behooves us to err on the side of the vast majority of Minnesotans are doing the right thing, just like the vast majority of businesses are, and ask people to adhere to it. And I'm trying the best I can to give the data based on the science, pushing the envelope as close as I can to opening things up, but again, none of this will work if we don't have people buy into the social distancing. So just to be candid with you, the last thing I ever want to do, I think they've issued 44 tickets or something I saw on this. Most of it is for people driving drunk or, or in the commission of another crime, why they're not social distancing. So they, they kind of added it on. Um, there's never a desire to go out and ticket someone on this. It's never a desire to make someone miserable. The idea is, is this is stuff works. It's proven to work. It's science-based. And I go back to that again. Those people who want businesses to open up because they know it's catastrophic to our economy and it's causing a lot of problems, um, and they know we have to do it with health in mind, are 100% right. Those people who want to open up businesses and do whatever they want because they think this is fake and it's like the foo, flu, they're 100% wrong. And I've got to base my decisions that I think Minnesotans will go for the former rather than the latter, and they'll continue to go on. But I, I hear you on this. There's, I, I, I got the same restlessness as everybody else, but we're at mile 20. It feels like it'd be easy to set down in this marathon. Um, we could rest and say we were pretty proud, but we're not going to finish. And this is unlike anything else. This stuff will come roaring back. You make a mistake, and it did what it did in Worthington. You make a mistake, it happens what, what happened in New York City. That's how quick it happens. Governor, a lot of concern in the statewide media again about agriculture and food systems. And today, yeah. Senator Gazelka said perhaps you should consider bringing in the National Guard to help some of these processing and delivery systems, especially with plants shutting down. Would you consider that? How concerned are you about from, from egg destroying product to processing? Oh, I'm super processing? concerned. What Senator Gazelka can be sure of, I know something about the National Guard. And what Senator Gazelka can be sure is that our emergency operations center is surrounded by some of the best people, both in business and outside of that. Um, we have explored that. One of the issues is, is what are you going to use them for? One of the issues on this humane depopulation of these, uh, uh, of these hogs and uh, of the poultry is, um, how do you dispose of them without contaminating groundwater? We have too high of groundwater table. How, what's the capacity? We went to Sioux City to find um, rendering plant facilities. We have explored looking at the National Guard and using what they have. What is their equipment? I, I have a printout in my office that I look at. I know every helmet they have. I know every piece of equipment they have. Um, it's not for the lack of having the drivers in that case. Some of it is for the lack of having the trucks to be able to use it because one of the things is construction season started now. And it's not a pleasant thought, but the disposal of tens of thousands of animals um, is a pretty complicated piece. But what I can assure you is, um, and I always welcome these suggestions, um, we are thinking about these things, we are using them, we're putting them in. What I am most concerned about is there are two principles, like at JBS and all the rest of these, that are not 
competing against one another, but we can't get into that fight that they are. The issue of the absolute necessity of opening them up. I agree with the president on an executive order saying that this is a critical industry, needs needs to be stayed open. You're right on that. But that industry will not open up if worker safety is not there. If the workers say, we're not going in there because it's too dangerous, they won't do that. I think what you're seeing in JBS is the entire community coming around that. And there is a workforce of team of really smart people, federal, local, state, private, um, working on this disposal piece. Governor Walz, Esme Murphy of WCCO, and I have a similar question about modeling. It's been at least three weeks since we've gotten any public information on the model that is yeah. guiding you. I, and I know there's something that sounds like is coming out maybe next week. Right now, are you still working off the modeling that you had from three weeks ago? And, and at what point, we, we were told by the researchers then that they were going to try to work on a more frequent update. But we've seen nothing since early. No, it's, it's one data point that, that we certainly use. There's many of them out there now. CDC has theirs that we, we look at other. It's one data point. The Minnesota one is unique because I think it takes a holistic picture over the whole length of the pandemic. Um, they are adding in data, and I think we're, we're close to that, to uh, getting them. But what I would tell people is is that when we started, and if I, I don't know which direction I was, where that, what we've all done in this. Oops. This was back March 13th and, and moving up towards um, March 25th. There was no model in America showing what this would look like. There was some early data coming out of Italy and China. University of Minnesota and our health department hopped on this first, and that model was finished um, somewhere around the 17th of March of where they looked at it. And that was one thing. We needed to get a snapshot of a picture. There was no testing. There was no one out there. We were using epidemiological data. Um, I think, again, as we said about modeling, it shows patterns of direction. I think that pattern of direction is true. I think uh, we still think that we are very close on the peak to being pushed out to the end of May, June, potentially a little longer. So not July. At one point, we're thinking June. Well, it could. I mean, it was in that box, that 95% confidence level. Um, I think what we think we're going to see is, is that box, because of the work we've done, probably moved a little further out but the real important thing that I'm looking at is we think it's going to drop some. And my hope is, is that that intersection line in that 95% confidence interval, that what's going to fall in there is hospital bed capacity, PPE capacity, workforce capacity. And I don't know at this time. It's preliminary. It's some of the things we're looking at. It's the curve that we're looking at. We're looking at modeling out of Washington and other states. I think that's probably where that's going to come out. But that is just one data point we use. That's not driving that decision because... The fact is, COVID's still here. The fact is, if you get it, there's a 5% there's chance, at least on that, that it's going to be pretty critical if you fall into that, that category of underlying health conditions. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about, uh, you had mentioned the possibility of bad actors among businesses, but that would be relatively little. Um, at the same time, you've talked about how a lot of these uh, restrictions for businesses are more or less voluntary. Um, what would you say to a worker who is worried that you know they may not be able to go in and expect yeah. the absolute highest best practices, um, especially like as all as we've all noticed, it's hard to buy even Lysol or hand sanitizer or something like that yeah. um, in this time. This is a great question, Bruce. This kind of falls in with you too. This is that compact between worker and employer, and and building that trust between them. That I I do think the one thing I would tell workers is is we want you to be very clear. We're not going to ask you. And I told the workers out at JBS out in Worthington, we're not going to ask them to go back into a situation that's unsafe. It would be my assumption that 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 business doesn't want them to go back in there because that creates a situation. One is the shortage of workers. Two is there is a you know, this is Yelp on steroids, if you will, about which businesses are doing this right. What is the word on the street, how they're getting it? But, uh, Steve, you want to talk about what, was, what does a worker do sure. if yeah, they get absolutely. in that situation? Well, I think, first of all, we hope that workers are collaborating with their employers on creating these plans. The best plans that are created to create safety out of workplace are going to be created when business and labor is working together. Um, 
But we also have set up hotlines uh, through OSHA and through the State Emergency Operations Center, which, which we're standing right now, for workers to call and let us know when businesses aren't getting this right. And that is an important piece of this, such that um, we are tracking how this evolves over time. And so um, I would also say that in addition to talking to businesses about this guidance, we've, guidance, we've talked to labor unions across the state, too. And I think it's business and labor that are helping us put these plans together. And um, it's as important to the business that can earn money by having uh, the ability to sell things as it is for the worker to get wages and health insurance and all the benefits that comes with work. And so getting that balance right is really important. Bruce, do you want to, yeah. how would you respond as business owner and represent that? No, it's, it's a great question. Of course, there always are bad actors, but by and large, especially in retail, you have to remember um, there's nothing more important than the consumer except maybe the employee that takes care of that consumer because they're critical to that consumer being happy. And especially today when we have uh, consumers that are concerned about their health and their safety, I think uh, the marketplace is going to do a really good job ensuring that the right pieces are in place, including uh, the right protections. In fact, I know retailers that, you know, they'll have the ability to do curbside on Monday. They won't do curbside on Monday. They might wait till Wednesday because they want to get uh, some PPE or some of the sanitizers or their own systems in place. So I think it's important to remember uh, under these guidelines, it's it's a day you can start, but it's not necessarily the day you have to start. And for retailers, they'll be really relying on what is my consumer going to feel good about? Because if the su consumer doesn't come back, there's really no need to be open or offering that service. Good. Um, Governor, question from Kevin Featherly about prisoners and a third facility now having cases, confirmed cases up to 170 perhaps plus, and the consideration of releasing some prisoners. It sounds like the commissioner has worked on that, but also ACLU wants it to go further. How yeah. many people we release and when? Well, thanks for the question, Kevin. This is We spend a lot of time every morning on this in our, in our briefing. Um, it's one thing we were worried about early on. Um, there's facilities in Ohio I, or in Illinois that, that every single person tested positive. Um, we know that we have situations from Moose Lake. We have a, uh, a work release type program uh, up north that, that we have cases too. Uh, ACLU uh, brought suit to try and release some of these people. The good news is Minnesota has the lowest incarceration rate of any state in the country. We have a lot of folks on work release. We also have, uh, I heard this statistic the other day, um, and crimes are down, but there's still a backlog in the courts is, is part of the reason. The lowest number of people re remanded to a state prison since 1967 um, over the last month. Um, we have the capacity, the commissioner has the capacity to, to release people on health related, which he has done. Um, I don't want to quote the exact number, but Mary, I'll tell Kevin that we'll get him that number so that get to where it's at. And we have attempted to try and those folks that were within 90 days of their release time anyway, they're going back out anyway, making sure there was a plan to move them out quicker. One of the problems we have is, is that you can't release someone if they don't have a home to be in, if they don't have some of those things, because then you're just adding to the pandemic and putting those people at risk. But I think this concern, both for the workforce that's in these facilities and those that are under our care, there's a humanity here that we cannot put them in situations where we're risking getting them. I think Department of Corrections is doing the best they can, but to physically separate is very difficult right now. And so I think what I would ask Kevin to do is maybe is have Commissioner Schnell follow up on this. It's a, it is a super important question. We are working on doing it. We have the, um, as I said, the lowest number of incarceration, but I don't think it's any secret. We have some pretty old facilities that just, are not great in this situation. And the same situation, there was a federal magistrate ruled on the issue of ICE detainees and, and how those are being dealt with. And that's a federal issue because of the federal. Governor, two quick questions, one from a viewer, one from Lori Fisher at Fox 9. In your presentation, you said bars and restaurants would be closed through May 18th. So she asks, should bars and restaurants and other retailers plan to potentially open after the 18th, or will that be another decision on the phase? And then secondly, from a viewer, uh, when can dentist offices begin working? Yeah, will there be a, a state of bad hair and bad teeth yeah. pretty soon? No, it is. Uh, surprising, there's, um, I tried the YouTube video on the haircuts. I'm not recommending it. It didn't get a star, for, as you can see. Um, but I tried. You can do about anything by YouTube. Um, yeah, this question on restaurants, this is, and again, I, I'm not even, uh, I, I, I won't even attempt the pain that these folks are feeling because this is such an 
industry with a small margin. It's so difficult. And the planning. I mean, they're right. When do we order food? When do we start getting things ready? When do we reset? We need some lead time to be able to do this. This sense of uncertainty, again, I, I try my best in, in trying to get these information out as fast as we can, but I know it still adds uncertainty. I think at this point in time that we're talking, and I want to be clear again, we attempt to try and move during this time. We didn't use these stay-at-homes to freeze in place and set there. We've used them to continue to move during them and then use them as inflection points. And, and Maybe I need to be clear at that. They're not goalposts. They're inflection points to adjust, know what we learned, and move forward. Because it's not about, again, I'm not saying she's going to be open on the 18th, but I'm not saying that there's not a way we can think about patios or there ways to do this. How do we start to understand? And I think Bruce's analogy is we're going to learn a lot by how they do this. We're learning a lot. Just to be candid, I talked to my other uh, governors. We're learning a lot from those other states. Um, I'm watching very closely what's happening in Georgia to see how that pans out. Um, and I'll be the first to tell you, if they don't see a spike in numbers and they don't think things going down, we'll learn from them. And I'm just afraid that that's not going to happen, but it's disingenuous to not say we're not going to adjust. So what I would say to those, to those restaurateurs, um, we're still looking at it. We know it's a hard one, um, but it's, again, it's, uh, it's a place where we can start thinking about it. And the same thing with, uh, I'm going to, I think we have time for one more question. I want to talk about this house of worship. I've spoken with a lot of clergy, uh, a lot of faith leaders. I'll tell you what, these folks are thinking about this because they know. And, and I think this is one, everybody has their own religious opinions. Um, but I think it's a valid point to say, you know, for many people, this is certainly an essential business. Um, and, and I would validate that, that I believe it is. And so their point was, is yeah, we can minister one-on-one, -on -one, but a lot of what we do in certain faith traditions is that sense of faith community gathered together and they are thinking through that and what i'm asking is is for them to continue to submit those things for us to take a look at it i'm pushing pretty hard on that one but um people are saying so what's the difference between a large church gathering in a in a movie theater what's the difference between a large church gathering and uh the ordway putting on a play how are you how are you measuring these things and jan would say what is the risk in those settings what is the probability what is the predictability or the non-predictability of how that event will play out and what does it mean afterwards the other question dental was services. dental services yes steve you want to talk about that sure this is a ppe issue too it is a ppe issue and it's a great question you know i think uh dental services are in that same spectrum of, of, of salons and and, and hair shops in which there's person-to-person -person contact. So we are having some good conversations with leaders in that industry about how they would get that right, what sort of PPE they would need, how they would manage traffic inside of the um, inside of the dental office. And so, you know, it's an active conversation. On that dial, it's a little trickier given the person-to-person -person contact, but that doesn't mean we can't get it right. We just have to make sure we do it when the time is right, phase it in appropriately, and then have the right guidance in place, which is going to be different than, you know, the guidance we've given for curbside delivery or pickup. It's going to be different than the guidance that we'll end up giving for, for restaurants and, and, and bars and things like that. And so each of these use cases deserves its own thoughtful consultation and as the governor looks at all these factors and decides how to turn that dial we'll make sure we give that guidance uh, in collaboration with those businesses to get it right. Part of this elective uh, surgery thing kind of in the same category? I think it potentially could be. I mean governor you can speak more to that but I think it, it's all in the space of like it, it's important to get your teeth clean and have healthy teeth long term. It, it's elective to some but in other ways it's, it's right. critical to health. Yeah. So. And there's been emergency surgery if you got impacted tooth, if you have root canal, those things have been out there. But I, I do think it's right. Yes, it's going to be part of that conversation we have that we know these are things that have to happen again. And I'm not going to make light of the issue of, of hair salons and, and getting your hair cut and things. These are important. Um, the issue we're grappling with is, is they're highly interactive. But I think you could argue, and these people are out there working really hard on this, is they are making the experience very predictable, is what they're saying. And we're getting to see some trial runs on that. And, and I would tell those people out there listening, looking for a glimmer of hope, it's our desire to open up as much as we possibly can. We've got about 82% of our businesses open. But I want to claim this. That is little comfort to the 18 that aren't there. And once we get open, and to think about this, by Monday, customer-facing retailers who want to be open for curbside and delivery are going to be open. Our hope is we learn a lot from that and we move a step further. Our elective surgery, get online if you have some comments on this. The person who's asking about dental, show us this, and we are looking at the PPE, um, that we can move those things back to open. I, I think if we get this right, we get most people back to work. We get in a place where we keep our numbers down by smart social distancing, mask wearing, testing, tracing, 
And we do it the Minnesota way where we have this weird new normal that lasts until we get the therapeutics and that, but that we reduce this economic pain to as low as we can, just like we're reducing the number of infections. And I don't think we've split on that. I get the desire, and I know there's some governors, it would be, I, I remember saying this, it was sometime in March, the end of March when we put this in, I wished I could give you a date and say at 10 a.m. on May 19th, we're going to ring all the church bells and we're going to honk our horns and we're all going to go back out and it's going to be back to normal. The virus will not allow us to do that, but I am not going to allow it to keep us prisoners in our house. I'm not going to let us to not think cleverly about how we can do this. I'm not going to allow us to put certain people at risk and say they're expendable or put businesses at risk one over the other. So those who are making those, those points about saying, why can't I be open? You're right. And that's what we're trying to figure out. We want to get there. So I think for all of us, this, this is, it, it's the challenge of many of our lifetimes that we've seen them trying to manage this. I would say today for all of you, as you're seeing this, there's an awful lot of positives to get out of this. Don't see just the May 18th as, oh, it's another deadline or whatever. Things have changed here, and they've changed for the, for the positive. They've changed on the testing front. They've changed on our ability to understand this better. They've changed on the businesses that are functioning and getting people back to work. Um, all of those things are a positive. So um, we'll be back. Uh, we'll keep our reports going. We'll get everyday updates. Our pledge to you is, is to use new data, to adjust it accordingly, and to, uh, uh, to make sure that we are balancing correctly public health with well-being and financial well-being. Walker, got one more. Uh, from Minnesota Public Radio wants to know about summer camps. If you haven't touched on that, will those be ready to go by June? And the Strib also wants to know about youth sports leagues, tournaments like the USA Cup. Um, you would touch on that. Yeah, no permanent decision yet. And again, I, I, I wish I could just be definitive. I, I think some places are making these calls really early. Um, and I think there's a school of thought that says, just take the uncertainty out of it and make the call. I think I'm a little more hopeful that, that we're figuring out new ways to do this, and I'm trying to hold out hope that we can do these things. So we've not issued that on there. I think each situation would be different. Um, if it's possible to, to uh, socially distance a summer camp in a way that makes sense, I think health is looking at it. They would give us either the, the yay or nay, or, or, or probably more importantly, they would give us their risk factors involved with it. So at this time, we have not decided. Um, we've not made calls. I know some are making calls on their own. Um, I still fall into the camp that this is evolving so quickly. Minnesotans are responding in such a positive manner that I think it behooves us to look at this in small chunks and not see those small chunks frozen in time to see us now. I think I see this next two weeks. Um, I saw the PPE in the hospital build up. I saw the testing, tracing, and thinking about getting businesses back. Now I want to think about the operational side of this, of, of what is it going to look like and what can we adjust. So I'm hopeful on that. I appreciate all this. And I would just a ask Minnesotans, uh, what you've done has worked. Um, it only works if, if you choose to do this. And as I said, wearing the masks and social distancing is for the first responders. It's for the most vulnerable. It's for your neighbors. And that's a tradition on many, many things that Minnesota has always done. Um, let's grind it out these last few miles of this marathon and get to the other side. So thank you. Bruce, thank you.